you are far superior to the lilies, which neither strive nor weave. As for yourselves, when you have no clothes, whatever will you put on? Who is the one that can lengthen your life? The very same will give you your clothes. So do not get all worked up, saying, what are we to eat? Or what are we to drink? Or what are we to wear? The pagans chase after all of these things, but your Father in heaven knows that you need them. Therefore seek his kingdom first, together with his righteousness, and every one of these things will be added unto you. Seek for things that are superior, and the inferior things will be given as well, seek after the things of heaven, and the things of the earth will be thrown into the bargain. For this reason, do not dwell on tomorrow, for tomorrow will dwell on itself. Each day, you see, has distresses sufficient for the duration thereof. Do not pass judgment, that judgment might not be passed on you. For to the extent that you judge, you will be judged, and to the degree that you calculate, it will be computed against you. Do not judge, and you will not face judgment. Do not criticize, and you will not be criticized. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and you will receive it back a heaping measure, all pressed down and densely shaken until it overflows generously into your lap. Whatever measure you use to meet it out, you see, will be used in measuring it back out to you and he spoke this parable to them. Can one blind man be guide to another? Won't they both fall into a pit? An apprentice is not above his master, yet anyone who takes these principles fully to heart will equal his instructor. Why do you inspect your brother's eye for a tiny wooden splinter, while ignoring the log that is in yours? How can you say to your fellow man, brother, let me take that speck from your eye when you fail to see the plank in your own? You hypocrite. Remove the beam from your own eye first, only then will you see well enough to dislodge the bit from your brothers. Do not give hallowed things to dogs, for they might fling them onto a pile of dung. Neither cast your pearls before swine, for they might trample them into the mud, then turn on you and tear you to bits. Ask, and you will receive, seek, and you will find, knock and it will open for you. Everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks is the one who finds, and to one who knocks, it is opened right up. Seek, and you will find, for before I would not tell you the things about which you were asking me then, I am anxious to explain them now, but you no longer seek for them. Recognize that the truth does not lie on the surface of things. Be in awe of the things that are before your eyes, and make this your starting point for further enlightenment. The ones who strive should not stop striving until they find. When they find, they will be shaken, and when they are shaken, they will be amazed, and will possess complete authority. And when they rule, then they will rest. Should any of your sons ask you for a loaf of bread, which of you would give him a rock instead? Were he to ask you for a fish, which of you would give him a snake? If, therefore, you know how to give good things to your children even, though you are steeped in error will not your heavenly Father bestow even greater favors upon those who ask of him? Out of this principle flows the law and the prophets. What you would have others do for you, that's what you should do for them. Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for the large gate and the wide road through which so many enter leads to utter devastation. But how very few are those who come across that tiny gate and narrow path that leads to life. Be on the lookout for false prophets, for they come to you dressed up like sheep, but beneath all that they are ravenous wolves. You can spot them by the fruit they bear. Do people pluck grapes from thorny bushes or figs from prickly plants? Similarly, every tree that gives good fruit is useful, but a tree that delivers up no edible fruit is useless. No good tree puts forth bad fruit, for a good tree cannot yield bad fruit. Neither does a bad tree put forth good fruit, for a bad tree cannot yield good fruit. Every tree is recognized by what it bears. People do not pluck figs from thorns, nor do they garner grapes from brambles. Every tree that fails to yield fit fruit is chopped up and relegated to the flames and so it will be that you will know them by their fruit. The virtuous man brings his goods up from his good heart's bounty, and the evil man brings up his own evil from his evil heart's inventory, and utters pure wickedness. Whatever fills his heart, you see, will flow forth from his mouth. For these people bring out abominations from what fills their hearts. And of those who say to me, Master, Master, many will fail to enter into the kingdom of heaven, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not use your name when we prophesied, and cast out demons, and performed so many miracles? I will therefore say to them in no uncertain terms, Go away you evil men, I never even knew you. If you rest upon my breast, yet ignore the will of my Father in heaven, I will shove you right off. Should each and every one of you be with me, even in my very bosom, and still not do as I say to you, I will shove you all aside and say, Get away from me. I have no idea where you evil workers came from. 
Why do you cry out to me, teacher? Teacher, when you do not do as I instruct. For this reason, I will show you what he, and indeed, everyone who comes to me to hear my words and acts on them is like. He is even as a wise house builder who shoveled deep into the ground, fixed the foundation on bedrock, and on that rock he built his home. The rain beat down and the rivers rose up, and when a flood came, it beat against that house, but was powerless to budge it on account of its strength. The gales blasted and pounded away at that house, but it pulled through, for it was founded on the rock. But someone, indeed, everyone, who hears my words and does not act on them is even as a senseless man who built his home upon the sand, upon ground without a foundation. The rain came down and the streams rose up, the winds blew hard and beat that house, and the instant that the flood hit it, it came down with a deafening sound, and it was completely destroyed. And after he had said these things, the crowds were taken aback by his teaching, for he taught them as an authority and not at all like the scribes. And a host of people followed him down the mountainside. The Faithful Centurion. Capernaum. Jesus then entered into Capernaum, where the servant of a centurion lay sick and on the brink of death. This servant was highly esteemed by his master. Now the centurion had heard about Jesus and had sent some Jewish elders up to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they got to Jesus, they begged him in all sincerity, this man is worthy that you should do this for him, for he loves our people and has even built us our synagogue. So Jesus went to that place with them. After Jesus had entered into Capernaum and had drawn near to the house, a centurion approached him, seeking assistance. The centurion had sent some friends of his up to Jesus to say, Lord, my servant boy is lying at home completely paralyzed in horrible pain. I will go and heal him, Jesus answered. Lord, the centurion replied, do not go out of your way, for I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. I did not even come out to you because I thought myself unworthy to. But if you would speak the word, my servant would improve. You see, I am myself a man who is subject to authority, and I have soldiers who answer to me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. I order my servant do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard such things from him, he was surprised and impressed by him. And turning to the multitudes that were following him, he said, I say to you in all honesty, Never before have I met anyone in Israel with this kind of faith. I am telling you that from the east and from the west people are going to be seated at the same feast in the kingdom of the skies as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the people of the kingdom are going to be cast out where it is dark and where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, and let it be as you believed. And his servant received his healing in that instant. And when the men who had been sent got back to the house, they found the servant there in perfect health. Jesus explains why he chose the twelve. Capernaum. After entering into Capernaum, Jesus went into the house of Simon, the one whom he nicknamed Peter. Then he said, As I walked along the lake of Tiberias, I summoned John and James, the sons of Zebedee, then Simon and Andrew, then Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the Iscariot. After that I called you, Matthew, even as you sat at the tax collector's booth, and you followed me. To represent Israel, therefore, I want you apostles to be twelve in number. Now I chose the twelve of you, deeming you to be worthy of me. I am sending you out into the world to make the gospel known to the world that they might be sure that God exists. Make known the future things that will come about through faith in me, that those who hear and believe might indeed be saved. Jesus raises a dead man. Nain. The next day Jesus moved on to a town called Nain, attended by his disciples and a very great multitude. And as he neared the gate of that town, there was this dead man being carried out, his widowed mother's only son, and many from that town, were there with her. Now as soon as the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Do not weep, he said to her. Then he drew near to the casket and touched it, and the pallbearers stood motionless. Young man, he said, I order you to rise up now. The one who had died sat up and started speaking. Jesus then restored him to his mother. They were all amazed and gave praises to God. A great prophet has risen among us, they all proclaimed. God has come down to his people. This story about Jesus spread throughout the land of the Jews and the regions beyond. John the Baptist's Inquiry. Galilee. John's disciples reported this to him, so when he heard in prison what the anointed was doing, John called two of them up to himself and sent them out to ask the Lord, Are you the one for whom we were waiting, or ought we to seek another? 
After the men had gotten to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us here to ask of you, are you the one who was to come, or should we wait for someone else? Right away Jesus healed many people who were afflicted by all manner of diseases, ailments, and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many of the blind. Then Jesus said to the messengers, go back to John, and let him know all that you have seen and heard, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf now hear, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poor. How blessed is he who does not take offense at me. As the disciples of John were walking away, Jesus started speaking to the gathering about him, what did you go into the wilderness to see anyhow, a mere wind-shaken reed? If this is not the case, then just what were you looking for, a man bedecked in silky smooth finery? Leaders, then, and prominent men? Of course you didn't, for truth is lost on those who dress comfortably in magnificent, costly apparel and live luxuriously in royal palaces. What did you go all that way for then? To see a prophet? That's right, and much more than a prophet I can assure you, because this is the one about whom it is written in the place where it says, I am going to send my messenger ahead of you, who will ready the way, that lies before you. Adam arose out of an immense vitality and an incredible abundance, but he proved to be less worthy than you, for had he been of a comparable worth, he would never have tasted of death. I am telling you the truth, when I say that from Adam down to John the Baptist no one who is born of women has come along who is so great that he should not feel compelled to lower his eyes to John the Baptist. Even so, whoever is least in God's heavenly kingdom and becomes a child will recognize the kingdom and become more illustrious than he. For from the time of John the Baptist, even to this very day, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and men of violence have seized it by force. For the law and the prophets prophesied all the way down to John, and he is that Elijah whose arrival was foretold, if you can but accept it. Someone who has ears will hear. And everyone, even the tax collectors, recognized the truth of God's way, when they heard the words that Jesus spoke, for John had baptized them. But the Pharisees and the scribes, in refusing the baptism of John, rejected God's design completely on their own. What is a good thing for me to compare this generation with? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces, calling out to one another, we played a flute, but you did not dance, and we sang a dirge, but you did not weep. John, you see, did not come eating bread and drinking wine, and they say he's demon-possessed. But the Son of Man did come eating and drinking, and they say, look, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a companion of tax collectors and of sinners. Wisdom, however, is defended by her children and vindicated by her deeds. Jesus condemns the cities. Galilee. Then Jesus started denouncing the cities where he had done the greater portion of his works, for they were utterly without shame. Curse you, Chorazin. Curse you, Bethsaida. Had the marvels that were worked in you been carried out in Tyre and Sidon, they would have long ago repented in sackcloth and ashes. But on judgment day Tyre and Sidon are going to fare better than you. As for you, Capernaum, will your praises reach the skies? Be assured that they will not. You will instead be thrown down into Hades. Had the kind of miracles that were worked in you been done in Sodom, it would still be here today. I am telling you that Sodom will be better off on judgment day than you will. Then Jesus said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I admire you for the way that you have concealed these things from intellectuals and scholarly types and revealed them instead to mere children. Father, this was indeed a gratifying spectacle for you. My Father has placed all things into my hands, and no one knows the Son except for the Father, and neither does anyone know the Father except for the Son and those to whom he chooses to disclose him. All of you who work hard, yet are burdened all the more, come to me, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon yourselves and learn directly from me, because I am approachable and down to earth, and peace will overtake your hearts, for my yoke is gentle and my burden is light. Woman Washes Jesus's Feet. Galilee. A certain Pharisee invited Jesus to dine with him, so he set out for this man's house and sat at his table. And behold, there was this sinful woman of that town who, when she found out that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, took an alabaster jar that was full of ointment, stood behind him, and started washing his feet with her tears and wiping them off with the hair of her head. And she fervently kissed his feet and rubbed them with the ointment. When he saw what was going on, the man who had bidden Jesus thought to himself, if this man were really a prophet, not only would he know who was touching him, but also how sinful this woman is. Simon, said Jesus, there is something I must say to you. Teacher, he answered, do tell. There were these two people who owed money to a creditor. One of them owed him 500 denarii, and the other only owed him 50. Now neither one could pay him back, so he cancelled both their debts. 
Which do you think will of him the more? I imagine it would be the one he more generously forgave, Simon replied. You have chosen rightly, answered Jesus. Then, turning to the woman he said, Simon, do you really see this woman? I entered into your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them off with her hair. You did not so much as give me a kiss, but this woman has not stopped kissing my feet from the moment I came. You did not rub my head with oil, but she has poured perfume all over my feet. That is why I am telling you now that, even though she owed a great debt of sin, because of her boundless love it has been forgiven her. But whoever has been forgiven but a little, also only loves a little. Jesus then revealed to her, your sins have been forgiven you. Then those people grumbled to themselves, who is this man that pardons sins? Jesus then bid the woman, go in peace, for your faith has made you whole. Acknowledgement of the Women's Contribution to Jesus's Ministry. Galilee. After this Jesus went all around, through this town and that, preaching the wonderful news of God's kingdom. The twelve were in that place as well, together with some women, that had been delivered from evil spirits and diseases, Mary, who is called Magdalene, out of whom there came seven demons, Chusa's wife, Joanna, steward to Herod, and a host of others too, including Susanna. These all gave of their own substance to help keep them going. Can Satan cast out Satan? Galilee. Then Jesus entered into a certain house, and once again, so many people gathered within it, that he and his followers could not even eat bread there. As soon as his family caught wind of it, they went over to get him, for they were all saying, he has gone completely insane. Then they brought this blind, deaf and demon-possessed man up to him, and Jesus healed him, driving out the demon of muteness, restoring both his speech and sight. And after the demon was gone, the hitherto speechless man began to speak, and the crowd was astonished, and they all began to wonder aloud, could this man be the son of David? But when the Pharisees and lawyers come down from Jerusalem heard such talk, all of them began to say, this man is possessed by Beelzebub. He is only driving out demons with the help of that prince of demons. Others put him to the test by demanding some kind of heavenly sign. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, called them over to himself and started speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? Every nation divided against itself comes to ruin. No kingdom with an internal rift has any lasting dominion, and no house that is self-opposed can go on for very long, for every city or house that acts against itself has no prospects for survival. If Satan battles against and casts out Satan, he is torn apart and cannot abide. He is caught in a civil war, so how is his kingdom supposed to endure? His end has come. This I say, because you claim, that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if it is by Beelzebub that I am ousting demons, then by whom do your people cast them out? These will therefore be your judges. If, however, I cast out demons by God's own spirit, the finger of God, then God's kingdom has risen upon you. The Father's kingdom is like someone who sought to kill a powerful man. Even before he left his home, he took his sword and thrust it into the wall to see if his hand would pass through. Then he slew the mighty one. When a stout man in full armor guards his own home, his possessions remain secure. But when someone stronger assaults and vanquishes him, he seizes the armor on which the man relied and distributes the plunder. To put it yet another way, how is it possible for anyone to enter into a strong man's home and make away with what he owns unless he first binds up the brute? Clearly, no one can go into his house and take of his things unless he ties him up ahead of time, only then will he be able to plunder the abode. Whoever is not for me is against me, and the one who does not gather with me only scatters. And truly this is why I say that every sin and blasphemy of mankind will be forgiven them. Anyone who speaks a contemptuous word against the Father has forgiveness, and anyone who rails against the Son of Man has forgiveness, but no one who blasphemes the Holy Spirit has forgiveness, neither on the earth in this age, nor in heaven during the age to come, but is guilty of eternal sin. This he said, because they claimed that he had an unclean spirit. How can you children of vipers speak anything reliably, seeing how thoroughly evil you are? For the mouth speaks what is from the heart. If you bring out what is in yourself, then what you have within you will deliver you. If you do not have it in yourself, then what you lack will do you in. The virtuous man brings choice things up from the good that he has stockpiled within, and the evil man brings vile things up from the sinfulness within himself. But I am here to tell you that on the day of judgment, men will be forced to answer for every word that they have spoken. For either by your words will you be acquitted, or else by your words you will be condemned. His followers asked him, Who are you to speak this way to us? 
You do not recognize who I am through the words that I speak, but have instead become like the Jews, for they either love the tree and hate the fruit, or they love the fruit and hate the tree. Either make a good tree that gives only good fruit, or make a bad tree that gives only poor fruit, for a tree is known by the fruit it bears. The leaders ask for a sign. Galilee. Then, as the gathering pushed forward, some Pharisees and lawyers bid him, Teacher, we would like to see you perform some kind of miraculous sign. Only an evil, unfaithful kind of people would need a sign, Jesus explained. This is indeed a wicked nation. It always calls for signs and wonders, but the only sign that it will be given will be that of the prophet Jonah. For in the same way that Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be assigned to this people. You see, for three days and three nights, Jonah was in the belly of a giant fish. And just like him, for three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. The people of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and pass sentence against it, because they changed their ways at the preaching of Jonah, yet here and now stands someone who is greater than Jonah. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment alongside this generation of men and condemn them, because she came from the farthest reaches of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and here and now stands a greater than Solomon. Futile Repentance and the Light of the Spirit Galilee. When an evil spirit leaves a man, it wanders about through arid places seeking repose, but finds it not, so it says, I will go back to my old home. But when it gets there, it finds the house in good order and swept clean, but also vacant. It then goes and finds seven spirits even more disgusting than itself and they go in and make themselves at home, and that man winds up worse off than he started out. That is exactly how this generation of degenerates is going to end up. And as Jesus was saying these things, a woman shouted from the crowd, How blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nursed you. But Jesus said, No. How blessed are those who hear God's word and hold to it, for the days are coming when you will say, How blessed is the womb that never conceived and the breasts that never nursed. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a hidden place or underneath a basket. He puts it on a stand instead so that those who go in might see by its light. The lamp of your body is your eye. When you've got good eyes, your entire body shines. But when they are bad, your whole body remains dim. You had better make sure that the light within you isn't really darkness instead. For this reason, if your whole body beams with light and there is no darkness in it, it will then be fully lit, just as though it were filled with lamplight. If they should ask you, where are you from, for their sake, explain to them, we came from the place of light, from where the light came into being all by itself and organized into images. If they should ask you, are you that light, reveal to them, we are the ones whom the light brought forth, and we are the chosen of the living Father. If they ask you, what evidence is there, that the Father is within you, simply answer, it is movement, and it is stillness. Many are gathered around the drinking trough, he said, but there is nothing in the well, many stand outside the door, but it is the solitary who enter into the bridal chamber. Jesus's True Family Galilee Jesus's mother and his brothers came to pay him a visit, but when they arrived at the place they could not get anywhere near him on account of the crowd. They wished to speak with him, so they sent someone in to call him out as they stood outside and waited for him. Even as Jesus was addressing the crowd seated around him, one of them informed him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside looking for you. They would like to see you and have a word with you. Who is my mother, he asked them, and who are my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him, and pointing to his disciples he said, my mother and my brothers are here with me. You see, whoever hears the word of God and acts on it, carries out the will of God, who is in heaven, who is my father, they are my brother, sister, and mother, and these are the ones who will make it into my father's kingdom. Pharisaism denounced the six curses. Galilee. After Jesus had spoken, a Pharisee invited him over to eat with him, so he went inside and sat at the table. When the Pharisee observed that Jesus had not washed before the meal, however, he was taken aback. Then the Lord admonished him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outer surface of the dish and cup, but deep inside you are full of greed and vice. You fools! Did not the same one who formed the outer also fashion the inner? You ought instead to offer to the poor what you have inside the dish that way all things will come clean for you. Curse you Pharisees, because you offer God tithes of mint, rue, and every other kind of herb, yet you ignore justice and the love of God. You should have acted on the latter and seen to it that the former did not remain undone. 
Curse you Pharisees, for you love the foremost seats in the synagogues and the salutations in the marketplaces. Curse you, because you are like unmarked graves, over which men pass without their knowing. Teacher one of the scribes retorted, You are reproving us also with what you are saying. And Jesus answered him, Curse you too, who teach the law, because you weigh people down with loads that they can hardly manage, and you will not help them out with even one of your fingers. Curse you, because you set up tombs for the prophets when it was your own forefathers who murdered them. This is how you betray your approval of the deeds of your forebears. They killed the prophets, and you build them their tombs. And because of this, God in his wisdom has said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some they will kill, and some they will maim. For this reason this generation will have to shoulder the blame for the blood of each and every prophet shed, since the world began, from the blood of Abel to that of Zechariah, who was slain between the altar and the sanctuary. Most assuredly I say to you that the entire blame will fall upon this generation. Curse you scribes, for you have taken away the key to knowledge. You never did manage to find it yourselves, and you have kept out those who would have gone in. And as he was saying these things, the scribes and Pharisees all became thoroughly enraged and started asking him a host of questions in an attempt to catch him in his words and thereby have something with which to charge him. The Teaching of the Holy Spirit. Galilee. At that time, when a gathering of so many thousands had assembled together in that place that they were stepping all over each other, he began to speak, cautioning his disciples, you must guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, for it is all a pretense. Nothing has been obscured so completely as to fail in its revelation, nor is anything so secret that it will not be disclosed in full. For this reason, the things you uttered while it was dark will be heard when it is bright, and what you spoke secretly behind closed doors will be heralded openly from the housetops. But I am telling you, my friends, stop being so fearful of those who, once they have put your body to death, can do nothing further to you. I will tell you, my friends, who you ought rather to fear, fear the one who after the killing has the power to cast you into Gehenna. Indeed I say, be fearful of this one. Do not five sparrows sell for two asaria? Yet not even one is forgotten by God. Indeed, every hair that is on your heads has its number, so stop being so spineless, you matter more than great numbers of sparrows. I am here to tell you that everyone who will acknowledge me openly before mankind, the Son of Man will acknowledge them openly before the angels of God. But anyone who denies me before mankind will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who defames the Son of Man will be forgiven, but no one who maligns the Holy Spirit will be forgiven. And when they lead you before synagogues, rulers, and magistrates, do not think about how you ought to respond or what you should say, for on that day, the Holy Spirit will give you the words. The Dangers of Worldliness. Galilee. And someone in the crowd yelled out to him, Teacher, tell my brother to split his inheritance with me. Order that these brothers of mine divide with me the things of my father. Mr. Jesus answered, Who appointed me as judge or mediator between you? Who has made me out to be a divider? And turning to his disciples he said, I am not a divider, am I? At that point he cautioned them, be on the lookout for covetousness, and, steer clear of it, for one's life is not to be found in an abundance of possessions. And he spoke this parable to them, there was this rich man with substantial means. Now he said, I will put my money into sowing, reaping, planting, and filling my storehouses with the goods, so as to lack nothing. Now this rich man's field brought forth a great crop, and inwardly this rich man thought, what should I do? I do not even have enough space to store all of my harvest. And he said, I know just what I will do, I will tear down the ones I have, and build myself even larger ones, and there will I store all of my grain and my goods. Then I will say to my soul, soul, you have many good things on hand for many years to come, so sit back now, eat, drink, and enjoy. You fool. God rebuke him. This very night will they demand your soul from you, who then will inherit all that you have prepared. Such did his heart imagine, yet he died that very night. Anyone here with two good ears should understand. It is just like this with the one who hoards up for himself, but is not rich when it comes to God. And to his disciples he said, For this reason do I say to you, do not be anxious about your life. Do not be concerned from dawn until dusk, or dusk until dawn about what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will wear. Life is more important than food, and the body is better than its clothes. Consider the birds, which neither plant nor harvest, nor possess any barns or storehouses, yet God nourishes them. How far better are you to doves? Which of you can add an hour to his life, or a cubit to his height? If you cannot do these minor things, then why trouble yourselves with these other details? Consider the lily, how does it grow? 
You are far superior to the lilies, which neither strive nor spin, but let me tell you that Solomon in all of his splendor was not decked out like one of them. Now if God so dresses the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow tossed into the oven, how much better will he clothe you, O you limited of faith? Now concerning you, when you have no clothing, whatever will you put on? Who is the one that can lengthen your life? The very same will give you your clothes. Do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink, do not be concerned with this, for the nations of the world chase after these things, and your father understands that you need them, but seek out first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added on. Have no fear, O little flock, because it was your father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your things to give to the poor, and make bags for yourselves that do not wear out, a surefire treasure in the heavens, where no thief can approach, nor moth destroy, for wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Be watchful. Galilee. Keep yourselves clothed in readiness, and your lamps burning. Be like men who are awaiting their master, when he comes back from the wedding feast, that they might open up the door for him the moment he comes and knocks thereat. And how joyful will those servants be when the Lord comes, and finds them watching. I tell you most assuredly, the Lord will dress himself, and have the watchmen all sit down to eat, and he will come, and wait on them. And if he should come in the second or the third watch, and find it so, those servants will fare extremely well. But you can all be sure of this, had the homeowner known, when the thief would come, he would have kept watch, and not allowed his house to get broken into. You, therefore, must ready yourselves, for the Son of Man is coming at a time that you don't know. Sir, Peter asked him, are you referring to us only in this parable, or also to these others? Tell me then, the Lord replied, who is the wise and faithful steward whom the Lord will set over his house to measure out the wheat when the time has come? It will truly go well for that servant whom his Lord should find so doing when he returns, indeed I say to you that he will set him over all he owns. But if that servant should say in his heart, my Lord is slow in coming home and therefore starts beating the male and female servants and being gluttonous and drinking to excess, that servant's master will come on a day he has not foreseen and in an hour that he does not know, and hack him to bits, appointing for him the inheritance of unbelievers. I will judge you in line with the way that I find you. That servant who knew the will of his Lord, yet failed to get things ready for him, or did not do according to his will, will be beaten with many lashes. He will be beaten with few who, though having done things that are worthy of lashes, did not know. Much will be required from all to whom much has been entrusted, and much more will be demanded of him to whom much has been committed. Jesus brings about a division. Galilee. I came to set the world on fire, and indeed, I have. Now behold, I am guarding it until it blazes. How I wish that it was lit already, but I have a baptism to undergo, and how troubled I am until it is done. Do you think that I came to pacify the world? Perhaps people think that I have come to bring them peace on earth. I am telling you not peace, but division. They are unaware that it is instead discord that I have come to cast upon the world, fire, sword, and war. After all, from this time forth, in a house of five, there will be three against two and two against three, a father opposing his son and a son opposing his father, a mother resisting a daughter, and a daughter resisting a mother, a mother-in-law versus her daughter-in-law, and a daughter-in-law versus her mother-in-law, and all of them will stand alone. He then explained to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising up from the west, immediately you say, a storm of rain is on its way, and even so it comes to pass. Also, when a south wind blows, you say, it is going to be a scorcher, and so it goes. You hypocrites. You know enough to read the face of earth and sky, so why can't you read the signs of the times? And besides all that, why is it that you fail to discern righteousness for yourselves? For even as you are on your way to the ruler with your adversary, you diligently try to free yourself for fear that he might drag you before the judge, and that the judge might turn you over to the jailer, and that the jailer might throw you into prison. I am telling you now that you will not get out until you have paid back the very last cent. Jesus demands repentance. Galilee. And some people who were there at the time were discussing with him the topic of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus said, Do you imagine that, because these people suffered such things, these men of Galilee were sinful beyond all other Galileans? I am telling you no, but all of you will come to this, if you should choose not to reform. How about those eighteen Wowier killed, when the tower fell on them in Silom? Do you imagine, that their debt was beyond that of other men in Jerusalem? I am telling you no, but if you should not repent, all of you will end up like that. 
and he spoke this parable, a certain man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard, and came looking for fruit thereon but never found any, so he complained to the vinegrosser, behold, for three years now I have come looking for fruit on this tree, and have never found any. Chop it down. Why make fruitless the ground that Idas is? Sir, responded the vinegrosser, leave it here for one more year, so that I might dig around it, mix in some manure, and then see if it bears you any fruit. If it does not, then go ahead and cut it down. Parable of the Sower. The Sea of Galilee. And that day Jesus left the house and started to teach as he sat down by the sea. A great many multitudes were gathered around him, and they came to him from this town and that. So much so, as a matter of fact, that he got into the boat and sat down on the sea, even as the crowd that had gathered there stood on the shore. And he began to speak to them again and teach them many things in parables. And as he was teaching them, he spoke this parable to them, saying, Hear this. A sower went out to sow his seed, took a handful and scattered. And it happened that, as he seeded it, some of it fell onto the road, and the seed got trampled down. And the birds came down from the sky, gathered them, and ate them up. Others fell onto the rock, or stony ground where there was not much dirt. These took neither root in the earth, nor did they form any heads of grain. And right away, they all came up, for the soil there was lacking in depth. Now as soon as they sprang up, the sun arose, and these for their lack of root and want of moisture, were scorched, and they withered. Others fell amid the thorns, and the thorns coming up with them, choked the seeds, and the worms devoured them, and so they did not yield their fruit. Still others fell on fertile ground. These came up, grew large, and all of them indeed bore fruit, some of them a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Again, one of them bore thirtyfold, another one bore sixtyfold, and another one a hundredfold. And he cried out, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Why Jesus uses parables. Beside the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus was alone, those who were around him came up to him, along with the twelve disciples, and asked him about the parable, Why do you speak to them in parables? And, What is the meaning of this parable? And he answered them, Whoever has come to see the world has exhumed a cadaver, and of that one who has uncovered the corpse, the world is not worthy. I clarify my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. Do not let your left hand in on the workings of your right. My mystery is for me to share with the sons of my house. I am giving you such an inheritance that nothing in this world can compare with it. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the heavenly governance and the mystery of God's rulership, but to these others it has been given only in parables. For to these this knowledge has not been given. No, for outsiders, all things are hidden away in parables, so that in seeing they may see, and yet never perceive, and in hearing they may hear, and yet never understand, lest they should turn, and be forgiven their sins. For it will be given to the one who has, and he will have it in abundance, and whoever has nothing, even what he does have, will be taken away. This is why I use parables, when I speak to these, for though they see, they don't perceive, and though they hear they don't discern, and neither do they comprehend. And fulfilled in them is the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, In hearing you will hear, and will never understand, and in seeing you will see, and never will perceive. For this people's heart has grown numb, they heard only wearily with their ears, and their eyes they have closed, lest with their eyes they should see, and with their ears they should hear, and with their hearts understand, that they might return to me to be restored. But joyful are your eyes that see, and joyful are your ears that hear, for truly do I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men wished to see what you now see, and did not see it, and to hear what you now hear, and did not hear it. Then he asked them, Is the meaning of this parable lost on you? How then will you decipher the rest? I am going to give you, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no hand has handled, and what has never risen in the hearts of men. Hear therefore the parable of the sower. The seed stands for the word of God, so what the sower sows is the word. Now those on the road, where the word is sown, are those who hear. Whenever anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it Satan, the devil, the evil one, comes along and quickly captures and takes the word that was sown in their hearts, lest through their belief therein they might be saved. This is that which was sown on the road. As for those who were sown on rock, these are the ones who are likewise sown on rocky ground. These, therefore, are the ones who hear the word, and upon hearing it, immediately receive the word with joy. They are, nonetheless, not firmly rooted in themselves. They, being the ephemeral sort, believe only for a little while, and they quickly lose their footing whenever, 
for the sake of the word, trial, or persecution comes, and they therefore fall away. And what was cast onto thorns, these are the ones who have been sown toward thorny places. And even though they hear the word, the age and its worries, the deceitfulness of riches, and the cravings for other things enter in and choke the word, rendering it unfruitful. And those who have heard, and venture forth through troubles and wealth, and the pleasures of this life, are strangled, and do not come to their fruition. And that which is sown on fertile ground, these are the ones who, once they have been sown, hear the word, and upon hearing the word with a true and righteous heart, understand it, accept it and hold on to it, and bear their fruit continuously. Some of them a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. One, indeed, bears thirtyfold, one sixty, one a hundredfold, and another one a hundred and twentyfold. And he asked them, Does one bring out the lamp only to place it under a jar, or, beneath the couch? Is it not meant to be put on a stand? Nobody lights a lamp, and covers it up with a vessel, or puts it under a couch. He puts it instead upon a stand, so that those who come in might see by its light. Know what is before your face, and what is concealed from you will be revealed to you. You see, nothing is so secret, that it will not surface, and, be exposed, nor hidden so well, that it will not become obvious and recognized, and, nothing is, buried that will not be exhumed. For there is nothing that was concealed that is not meant to be revealed, nor was anything kept hidden, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears that hear, let him hear. And for this reason, Jesus advised them, consider carefully the way that you hear. It will be measured back out to you in line with the way that you measure, and it will be added to those of you who are able to hear. More will be given to him who has something in hand, but it will be taken away from him who appears to have, and yet does not. Those who are holding nothing will be stripped of even the little that they have. The Weed and the Tares. Beside the Sea of Galilee. And he spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of the skies is like a man who had good seed, which he sowed into his field. His enemy came by night and planted tares among the wheat, and ran away, while the men were asleep. And when the wheat sprang up and yielded fruit, the weeds appeared along with it. Now the man did not let them pull up the tares. The servants of that householder approached him and asked, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where did all of these weeds come from? An enemy has done this, he answered. Would you have us go and pull them out? The servants asked. No, the man replied, for if you go gathering up the tares, you might uproot the wheat with them. Let the two grow alongside each other until the harvest, for at the time of the harvest, the weeds will be conspicuous, and I will say to the reapers, gather up first the tares, and tie them into bundles to burn, then gather the wheat into my barn. The seed grows by itself. And he said, this is how God's kingdom is, it is as though a man should cast his seed upon the ground, and day and night go to sleep and rise again. He has no idea how the seed springs up or grows, for the earth brings forth the grain by itself, first a blade, then an ear, then the grain grows full within it. Now when at last the grain is ripe, the harvest time has come about, so without delay he sends the sickle. The mustard seed beside the Sea of Galilee. Tell us what the kingdom of the skies is like, the disciples asked Jesus. And he said another parable before them, what can we liken God's kingdom to, or what parable can we use to describe it? The kingdom of the skies is even as a mustard grain, which a man took and sowed in his field. And when it is cast upon the earth, it is indeed less than any other seed, but whenever it falls upon, or, is planted in prepared soil, it grows to become greater than all other plants. And after it is fully grown, it becomes the greatest of herbs, becoming a tree, and, a shelter, producing limbs so enormous, that the birds of the sky, can rest under the shade, of, its branches. The Woman and the Yeast. Beside the Sea of Galilee. He laid another parable before them. The Father's heavenly kingdom is like yeast, out of which a woman took a small amount, and hid it in three measures of meal until the batch was thoroughly leavened. Then she formed the dough into giant loaves. Anyone here with ears should hear. The woman and her jar of meal beside the Sea of Galilee. The Father's kingdom is like a woman who was carrying a full jar of meal. As she walked along a distant road, the handle of the jar broke and the meal trickled out behind her along the path. She did not notice it at the time, but was unaware of her misfortune. Only when she had reached her house and put down the jar did she learn that it was empty. Jesus speaks to the people only in parables. Jesus spoke all these things to the people in the language of parables, and he did not say anything to them except through parables, to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, I will open up my mouth in parables, proclaiming things hidden from the world's foundation. Jesus explains the wheat and the tares to his disciples. 
in a house with his disciples. Then Jesus left the crowds behind and entered the house. And his followers approached him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered them, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the evil one, and the devil is the enemy that sowed them. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So even as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of this age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom everything that stands against it, along with those who commit lawless acts, and toss them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Then the righteous ones will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears that can hear, let him hear. Treasure hidden in the field. In a house with the disciples. Again, the heavenly kingdom is like someone who had a treasure hidden in his field, but knew nothing about it. When he died he left it to his son. The son knew nothing about it either. He took possession of the field and sold it, a man then found the treasure and hid it, and he joyfully went and sold all that he had, and bought that field. The buyer went plowing, uncovered the treasure, and started lending money at interest to whomever he pleased. The word that was given freely must never be sold. The Pearl of Great Price in a house with the disciples. Again, the Father's heavenly kingdom is like a businessman who had a supply of merchandise and was in search of quality pearls. That dealer was wise. He found one pearl that was especially precious and went and sold all of his goods and bought that singular pearl for himself. And so it goes for you as well, look for his reliable and enduring treasure where no moth devours and no worm destroys. The Large Fish. And he said, the true human is like a wise fisherman who cast his net into the sea and pulled it out full of little fish. The discerning fisherman spotted a large, choice fish among them. He threw all of the smaller ones back into the water and had no trouble in choosing the large. Anyone here with two good ears should hear. The two kinds of fish. In a house with the disciples. Again, the heavenly kingdom is like a net that was cast into the sea and which took of every kind. And when it was full, men dragged it ashore. Then they sat down, gathering the good ones into baskets and casting the bad ones aside. That is how things will come about at the end of the age. The angels will come and sever the wicked from among the righteous and hurl them into the flaming furnace, where it will be all weeping and grinding of teeth. Closing Parables In a house with the disciples, Jesus asked them, Are all these things now clear to you? Yes they are, they answered him. For this reason, he explained, every scribe who has been initiated into the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings out of his storehouse things that are both new and old. Someone is counted rich in God when they recognize that the ancient things of ages past are what is new and that what is new is really old. And as far as they were able to hear, he spoke the word to them using many such parables, and he spoke nothing to them except through parables, but when he was alone with his disciples, he would work them all out for them. And so it happened that, after he had finished speaking these parables, Jesus moved on. The winds and the waves obey Jesus. By and upon the Sea of Galilee. My children, who have given your lives over to the Lord, have no fear, because the Lord will never forsake us. At that time we were alone with our Lord. Now on that day, when evening had come, it happened that Jesus saw great masses gathered around him. He then gave orders to travel on to the other side of the lake, saying to us, Let us pass to the further shore. And we took him into the boat as he was, leaving the crowds behind us there. And after he had climbed aboard, we disciples followed after him, and then we shoved off. And there were also other small boats with him. And while he was on board, he quietly lied down in order to test us, and fell into a deep sleep as we sailed along, though he was not truly asleep. And behold, a great, tempestuous windstorm rose up in the sea and bore down upon it. And the sea became so rough that the waves were pounding against the boat and towering over the sail of the ship such that it was being filled. And by that time it was almost full and they were all in mortal danger, but he was sleeping on a pillow down in the stern. And we, his disciples, came up to him saying, Master, Master, we are all about to die. Lord, save us. We are perishing. Teacher, do you not care if we all die? And seeing that we were terrified, he woke right up and questioned us, Oh you limited of faith, tell me why you're so afraid. Then he stood to his feet and reproved the winds and commanded the raging waters of the sea, Be silent and still. The waves subsided and the wind was lulled and a great calm settled in. All things are obedient to him, you see, 
for they are all his handiwork. Why are you so full of fear? He demanded. How have you come to such unbelief? Where is your faith? And the men, paralyzed with fear, said to each other in utter astonishment, who can this be? From where is this man, that he even commands the winds and the waves and they obey him? And for this reason, my children, do not ever be afraid, for the Lord Jesus will never forsake us. Healing the Demoniac. Eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee and he sailed down, with, them to the region of the Gadarenes, and came to land on the other side of the sea, to the place that was opposite Galilee. And two demoniacs who were so violent that no one was able to pass that way, came out from among the tombs and confronted him. When Jesus had come out of the boat and stepped ashore, he was met by one of the demon-possessed, filthy-spirited men who had come out from that town's cemetery to withstand him. This man had worn no clothes for a long time now, nor had he lived in any house, but only there among the tombs. The demon had taken control of him on numerous occasions, and no one was able to keep him tied down any longer, even with a chain. He had been shackled many times, you see, and in spite of being bound up hand and foot, and constantly kept under watch, he still managed to shatter his chains and demolish his foot irons, and be driven by the demon into desolate places. There was no one strong enough to overpower him, and he would cry out day and night amid the tombs and hills, and mutilate himself with rocks. As soon as he saw Jesus from afar, he ran up to him, fell to his knees before him, and shouted out as loud as he could, tell me what you want from me, Jesus, son of the most high God. I beg you, please, do not hurt me. Swear to God that you won't torment me. Jesus, you see, had ordered the filthy spirit to leave the man, saying to him, you unclean spirit, come out of him. What is your name? Jesus demanded. Legion the man replied, for we are many. Multitudes of demons, you see, had entered into him. Son of God they all cried out, tell us what you want from us have you come to torment us before the time? Now he and the demons pleaded persistently with Jesus not to cast them out and make them go down to the abyss. A short distance away from them, on the slope of a nearby hill, a giant herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the swine, saying, if you force us out, then send us to that herd of pigs and let us enter into them. And Jesus agreed, saying, go ahead. So when the evil spirits left the man, they all went into the pigs, and the entire herd nearly two thousand in number raced down the steep embankment into the sea, where, drowning in the water, they died. When the herdsmen saw what had been done, they dashed into the city and through the countryside, proclaiming all that they had seen, including what had become of the demoniacs. And the whole town went out to meet him, and to see all that had happened. And when they came to him and saw him there, they found the man who had been possessed, but from whom the legion of demons had fled, sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully dressed and sound of mind, and all of them were petrified. Those who had seen the event explained to the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, how he had been healed, and about the swine as well. Then everyone in the region of the Gerasenes started begging Jesus to leave their presence and their land, for all of them were terrified. So Jesus went aboard the boat, and as he was climbing in, the man who was formerly possessed by demons asked if he might travel on with him. Jesus would not let him come, but sent him away, saying, Go back home to your family and let them know how much the Lord God has done for you and the kindness he has shown to you. Then he shoved off. So the man went into town and onto the Decapolis and began to proclaim what a marvelous thing that the Lord had done for him, and they were all astonished. The Feast at Levi's. Capernaum. Now when Jesus had once again crossed over and returned to the other shore of the lake, a large crowd greeted him and surrounded him, for they had all been awaiting him. A great throng gathered around him and he started teaching them. Then Levi held a feast for Jesus at his home. As Jesus was eating at Levi's house, large numbers of tax collectors and sinners and others came around and dined with him and his disciples. Many, you see, had followed him there. But the Pharisees and their scribes saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors. They grumbled to his students, demanding, why do you and your master eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard them asking this, he answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. You ought to go and learn what it means to say I long for mercy and not sacrifice. It is not the righteous, you see, but the unrighteous instead that I have come to call to repentance. And it was in his choice of the apostles that he truly showed he was the Son of God, for the ones that he selected were sinful above all others, which was proof that he came to call sinners to repentance and not saints. John's followers questioned Jesus. The followers of John were fasting, as were the Pharisees. 
At that time, some of John's students approached Jesus and asked, why is it it we, the followers of John, fast and pray all the time, as do the disciples of the Pharisees, but your disciples never do. To the contrary, they are always eating and drinking? Can you compel the guests of the bridegroom to fast, while he is yet with them? Jesus replied. How is it even possible for the bridegroom's guests to fast and mourn while he is there? They cannot so long as the bridegroom remains. But the time is approaching when the groom will be taken from them, then will begin their day of fasting. Their fast, therefore, will be in those days. Come now, they urged him, let us all fast and pray. For what reason, asked Jesus. What offense have I committed, or in what way have I been overcome? After the groom has left the bridal chamber, then the people can fast and pray. Then he spoke this parable to them, no one rips a piece off of new clothing and sews the new patch onto old. If he should, the newer piece would shrink, tearing the older clothing even further. He will have ripped the new garment all the more, and the new portion would no longer fit the old. And no men pour fresh wine into used wineskins either. If they should, the fresh wine would pop the skins, and the wine would flow right out, and the wine in the skins would be destroyed. No, fresh wine has to be put into new wineskins. They, therefore, put it in the new, that way they are both preserved. Also, after drinking the old wine, no one ever wants the new, for they hold that the older is the better. The Raising of Jairus's Daughter, The Healing of the Bleeding Woman, Capernaum. At that moment, even as he was saying these things, one of the rulers of the synagogue, a man named Jairus, came in. And as soon as he saw Jesus there, he went up to him and knelt before him. And he fell down at his feet and solemnly begged Jesus to go to his house because his only daughter, a twelve-year-old girl, was near to death. My daughter is in the throes of death and by now has passed away. But kindly come and place your hands on her that she might receive her healing and she will live. So Jesus and his followers got up and went with him. And as he was on his way, a great crowd followed after him, squeezing him almost to the point of crushing him. And there was this woman there who, for twelve years had been the victim of bleeding, yet no one had been able to cure her. She had suffered a great deal, while under the care of many physicians, and had spent all that she had on doctors, but rather than getting any better, she had only gotten worse. And when she came to hear of Jesus, she said in her heart, if I were to, but touch his clothes, I would be healed. So right away she snuck up behind him, and touched the hem of his robe, and in that instant the woman was healed. Her bleeding stopped, and she perceived within herself that she'd been delivered from her suffering. Jesus immediately sensed power flowing out of him, so he turned around amid the crowd, asking, who was it that touched my clothes? You see all of these people thronging you, his students replied, and yet you ask, who touched me? But he kept on looking to see who it was. Who has touched me, he demanded. When everyone there denied it, Peter responded, teacher, the people are swarming all around you and shoving up against you. But Jesus answered him, someone here has touched me, though. I am sure that power has flowed from me. Jesus turned around and looked at her. Then the woman, realizing what had changed within her and seeing that she could not hide, came and fell at his feet trembling with fear. And she confessed the truth before them all, her reason for touching him and how she had been so quickly cured. Take heart, my daughter, he assured her, what healed you was your faith. Go peacefully along your way and be free of your affliction. And even as Jesus was speaking, a certain man came, with, some from the house of Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue. Your daughter's dead, the man declared. Do not continue to trouble this teacher, for, it will do you no good. When Jesus heard this, he ignored their words and counseled Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, have no fear, for if you would just believe, then your daughter would be healed. He allowed only Peter, James, and his brother John to follow him. When he got to the home of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw the people in an uproar, crying out and lamenting, mourning for her as loud as they could. At that point, he went inside, allowing none but Peter, John and James to go in with him, along with the father and mother of the girl. When Jesus entered the ruler's house, he saw the flutists and the disorderly crowd and questioned them, why all this lamentation and commotion? Get out. Enough with all of your weeping. This child is not dead, but only sleeping. Still, sure that she was dead already, they all simply laughed at him. But after ushering these people out, he took the father and mother of the girl, along with the disciples who were with him, and went into where the young child was. He took the young girl by her hand and said, Talitha Kaum, which translates as, I say young woman, rise up now. Then her spirit was restored, and she immediately got up and started walking around. This utterly astounded them, and he solemnly bound them 
not to tell anyone what had happened, nor to allow anyone to find out about it. Then he had them give her something to eat. Jesus heals the two blind men. And as Jesus moved on from there, two blind men followed after him, crying out, Son of David, have mercy on us. When he got to the house, the sightless men came up to him. Do you believe that I can do this? He asked them. Yes, Lord, they answered. Then he touched their eyes and said, Let it be to you as you believed, and their eyes were opened. Then Jesus ordered them sternly, See that no one hears of this. But they went right out and spread his name throughout the land. And behold, even as they were leaving, they brought a speechless, demon-possessed man over to him. After the demon had been cast out, the man who had been mute began to speak, and the people cried out in astonishment, Never has this been seen in Israel. It is only through the Lord of demons, the Pharisees contended that this man is ousting demons. Jesus dishonored in his own house. Nazareth. Jesus left that region for his own, and his students followed him. He arrived in his hometown, and when the Sabbath came around, Jesus started teaching the people in their synagogue. And many of those who heard him there were amazed, asking, where did this man learn all this? What kind of wisdom is this that has been given to him, that he does such marvels? Is this not the carpenter, the son of the carpenter, and, of Mary? His mother's name is Mary, right? Are not James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon his brothers? Are not his sisters here with us? And they all took offense at him. But Jesus informed them, a prophet only lacks honor in his own hometown, in his own household, and in his own family. He was unable to work any wonders there, except to lay his hands upon and heal a few of the sick. And he was astounded by their lack of faith, and it was owing to their unbelief that he did not perform a great many wonders in that place.